The following is a message from the pulpit of the Bible Baptist Church of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, led by Pastor Philip Blackwell. It is our desire that God would use this message to be a help and a blessing to you. If you're looking for a traditional church where Christ is preeminent and the membership is family, we invite you to come and be our guest. Now may God bless you as you listen. Amen. Well, at this time, we'd like to uh, welcome uh, Brother Matthew Tilly up here tonight. Please uh, pray for him in your hearts and be attentive to his message. And then Adrian will follow right after him and be attentive. And the Lord will speak to us and bless us now. Amen. Welcome, brother. If you will, take your Bibles with me and turn to uh, Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter number 1. Galatians chapter number one. Galatians chapter one, starting in verse number one. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so soon, so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men, or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for this uh, day you've given us, Lord. Just be with us tonight, Lord. Um, uh, fill me and Brother Adrian with your spirit, Lord. Fill us with boldness, Lord. Um, let the hearts of uh, your people be receptive tonight and just let your Holy Spirit run rampant, Lord. I pray that uh, we all have a good night, Lord, and uh, travel safely back home, Lord. Please be with those prayer requests that were made tonight, Lord, and um, just let all things be done um, to your glory and honor, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. So Galatians chapter 1, it, uh, the title of my sermon tonight is Three False Doctrines of Calvinism. Three False Doctrines of Calvinism. And Galatians, in, in Galatians, he's talking to the Christians at Galatia, and he's marveled that they're so removed to another gospel, that you know he preached the gospel to them and they got saved, and he's just... He's so surprised that they're just removed from it, and they're trying to go after the law. They're trying to be circumcised. They're trying to keep the religion of Judaism and not following the gospel that he he gave to them and he preached to them. But I'm going to be going against Calvinism, and Calvinism is a wicked false doctrine that's been um, creeping into churches lately, and it origin originated from uh, John Calvin. And I don't have time to, you know, go through and explain every doctrine. Uh, basically, they go through, they have a set of uh, false doctrines that they hold to, which is called the TULIP. And the TULIP um, is an acronym for Total Depravity, Unconditional Election, Limited Atonement, Irresistible Grace, and Perseverance of the Saints. Not to be confused with Preservance of the Saints. But, um... This is the acronym that they hold to, and some of them will say that they hold to all these points. Some of them will say 
that they're a two-point Calvinist, a three-point Calvinist, whatever. But um, the basic fact is that it's all false. Um, but I'm just going to be going against three parts of it and showing the false doctrines of those three. And we're going to be going over um, unconditional election, limited atonement, and irresistible grace. So, <clears throat> so there we see at Galatians that he's he's um, marveling that they are removed from this, and uh, that and Calvinism again. And one one main thing that they say is that you know God is sovereign, and that God just chooses who's going to be saved, who's going to be damned. It's just all of all of to Him, and that God's just in everything, and that. You know, you have no choice. There's no choice. There's no free will. It's just all God and, you know, whether you're cursed or damned and or, or blessed and you're saved, the elect, then, you know, it's, it's all his choice. You have no free will. And if you will, turn to Revelation chapter 22. And we're going to be talking about that, that unconditional election. And this is what... That means it's where God is choosing who's going to be saved, who's going to be damned, who's going to be elect, and who's not. Revelation chapter 22. I'm going to read from Romans chapter 10, verse 13. You probably can all quote it. But uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So he's saying that anybody can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. It's not just the elect. It's not just who God chooses to be saved. It's whoever calls on the name of the Lord. Revelation chapter 22, starting in verse 16. The Bible says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star, and the Spirit, referring to the Holy Spirit, and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the, the water of life freely. So he's saying, Whosoever will, whosoever um, wants to come and take of the water of life freely, whosoever wants to be saved, come and pray, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and get saved. It's not up to God that Who's going to be saved? Who's going to be damned? Of course, God knows who's going to be saved and who's going to be damned. But you you ultimately have the choice. Either you're going to accept him or you're going to reject him. That's what the Bible teaches. So all throughout the Bible, there's references to free will. You see free will offerings in the Bible um, in the Old Testament. You also see uh, Joshua. He says, choose you this day whom you shall serve. And as for my house, we will serve the Lord. <clears throat> so free will is referred throughout the um, Old and New Testament, and it's not just who's gonna who's who God's gonna choose and who's God's just gonna reject, and and it's just a false false doctrine. It's a false gospel. <clears throat> so, and even when they say you know the elect and the damned, um, they have no, they still have no assurance of salvation. You know if the Bible teaches that once we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're sealed unto the day of redemption. Uh, we're, we're saved. And the Bible promises over and over again that we're saved. It says, you know, thou shalt be saved. It promises us that. But within Calvinism, there is no promise. You're just hoping that you're one of the elect, you know. And you're, you're praying that you're not, you know, the rejected of God. But it's, it's a false gospel. It's like... Um, God's a football coach or something and he's saying all right you're on my team you're not you're on my team you're not you know it's it's a false doctrine it's one of the dumbest doctrines out there that um, just completely flies in the face of the true Bible but so that was unconditional election again it's talking about God just chooses who's going to be saved who's going to be damned there's no free will and this is a false doctrine that any babe in Christ can prove false all right, so now we're going to focus on limited atonement. And if you will, turn to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Limited atonement is probably one of the worst 
doctrines within Calvinism, if not the worst. Um, this teaches that Jesus Christ died for only a few. He only died for the elect, those that's going to be saved. And this is completely against the Word of God again. Um, the Bible says that that Jesus Christ died for the world. Um, but while, while you're turning to 1 John chapter 2, I'll read for you from Hebrews chapter 2. The Bible says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God should taste death for every man, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man, not just those who's you know going to be saved and those who's not. It says all, all he died for all. He died for the world, and this is proven all throughout the Bible again. But First John chapter two, starting in verse number one, the Bible says, "My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, for the elect sins." And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So he died for our sins, the elect sins, but he also died for the world's. And whosoever believes on him will get their sins forgiven and they are saved. It's not just who, who God chooses and who doesn't. Who he doesn't choose. <clears throat> it says in John chapter 3 verse 16, the most famous verse in the Bible. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This goes against both of those doctrines of lim limited atonement and unconditional election. So limited atonement, it says, for God so loved the world. He didn't just love the elect. He didn't just love, you know, those that's going to be saved. He said the world, you know, for those that are sinners and those that's going to be saints. So, Let's turn to John chapter 6, verse 44. <clears throat> John chapter 6, verse 44. This is a verse that many Calvinists will bring to you um, when you're talking to them. This is a verse that's used and abused by Calvinists many times. <clears throat> John chapter 6 verse 44 the Bible says no man can come to me except the father which hath sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day so Christ is saying no man can come to me except the father which hath sent me draw him and I'll raise him up the, at the last day and they'll say well you're not going to be saved unless God draws you unless you know and you have to be elect but Let's turn to John chapter 12. Let's see if that's what he means there. John chapter 12. <clears throat> Bible says in John chapter 12 verse 32 it says, And I, this is Christ himself speaking, it says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This, this he said signifying what death he should die, referring to the crucifixion. But he said, if I be lifted up from the earth, he will draw all men to me. So it's not just the elect that's going to be drawn to salvation. It's all men that are called to be saved, that's drawn to be saved. We just have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, put our faith and trust on him, and get saved. <clears throat> and this, you know, this is just a wicked false doctrine, one of the wicked false doctrines of Calvinism, this um, limited atonement. If you will turn to John chapter 5 verse John chapter 5 verse 39 and 40 We're going to focus on now irresistible grace so we focused on limited atonement we focused on unconditional election now we're going to focus on uh, irresistible grace and irresistible grace means that once God calls someone once God draws someone to salvation um, they cannot resist that grace. They cannot resist uh, being saved. But the Bible teaches differently. The Bible says in John chapter 5, starting in verse 39, it says, Search the Scriptures. This is Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ again. Search the Scriptures. 
for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. So Christ is telling these that he's talking to that you won't come to me that you might have eternal life, have have life. So he's saying that, you know, they're he's uh, calling them to be saved, but they are they will not come to him. They're resisting him. They're rejecting Christ. <clears throat> if and it says in Proverbs chapter one, starting in verse twenty four, you don't have to turn there. But it says, Because I have called, this is God speaking, Because I have called, and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set it not in all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I, will, I also will laugh at your calamity, I will mock when your fear cometh. So he's saying, Because I have called, and ye refused. Ye refused that salvation, so he's going to laugh at your calamity. He's going to... You know, mock you when when you're when it's time for you to go. Um, so there, this doctrine of irresistible grace is another false one. It's another false doctrine. Calvinism is full of them, and we need to just uh, keep to the doctrines that we have um, that we have been taught. We need to just keep on and hold hold fast the faithful word that we have been taught. We need to not be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So we need to just fight the good fight of faith, um, fight against these false doctrines. We need to go to the Calvinist and uh, show the scriptures and be able to show them that it's not just the elect, it's, you know, it's for everyone and that, you know, they have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved, and we need to be able to go against this false doctrine. So that's the three false doctrines of the TULIP, the uh, acronym used within Calvinism, which we looked at unconditional election, limited atonement, and irresistible grace. Um, and we need to just stay faithful, not to be deceived by these false doctrines, these false prophets, we need to just hold fast the true word of God and the true doctrines in it. And to be, to be honest, the Calvinism is just just promotes laziness. It promotes slothfulness. You know, John Calvin was just basically a navel gazer that um, just said, "All right, it doesn't matter if you go soul winning. It doesn't matter what you do. God's already chosen who's going to be saved, who's not. And there's no free will and all this. And it's just it's, it's false, and we need to stay away from it. Um, if I was a Calvinist, you know, I would just stay home. <laughs> you know, there's there's nothing, you know, if if God just chooses who's going to be saved, who's going to be damned, then why go out and preach the gospel? Why do the things that we do? But it's false. We need to hold true to the Word of God and, and just stay faithful in what we do. Stay faithful in soul winning. Stay faithful in going to church, read our Bibles, and uh, ask God to uh, hide us from these false doctrines, to hide us from these false prophets and false perversions of the Bible. Um, let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, just uh, thank you for this uh, time, Lord. Just thank you for letting me give, get an opportunity to preach once again, Lord, and um, please be with Brother Adrian as he preaches, Lord. Fill him with boldness, Lord. Fill him with your spirit, Lord. And um, just let all the hearts be receptive to your word, Lord. Um, I pray that you just hide us from these false doctrines that's, um, that goes against your word, that flies in the face of your word, Lord. Hide us from these. Keep us faithful, Lord. Keep us to true to your, wor to your word and just to... Uh, Go against these false doctrines and be able to save these people that believes in these things, Lord. And just thank you for everything you do for us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're going to have Brother Adrian come and bring us another method, message. Yes, no, that's for the, this up here.
All right, tonight we're going to be in the book of James, be in chapter 1. All right, starting in verse 2, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that God giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So tonight I want to speak to you about the trying of your faith. Trials build faith and patience. Trials also help draw us closer to God. And real quickly, I just wanted to point a few things out before I get started. This word diverse here, it refers to various kinds. It's not like divers, like, you know, that go out in the ocean. And also this word temptation, in this particular text, it's talking about tests or trials, not necessarily being tempted with sin or something of that nature. But tonight I want to ask you this question why do we go through trials well a lot of people think that when you get saved that we don't go through trials but God never promised us that as a matter of fact in Philippians 129 it says for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him but also to suffer for Christ's sake and you ask what does that mean well our job is to give the gospel out and sometimes in doing that we suffer and, you know, sometimes like, me and my wife are going through a trial right now. And, you know, you, people might ask, well, why are you going through a trial? Well, you know, the loss, they see this. And I'm going to be honest with you. I've never had so much peace about going through a trial as I have right now. And the loss, when they see this, they question, well, how is that so? Well, let me put it to you this way. It's because I've got the comforter. In John 14... Verses 26 and 27. Give me just a second as I turn there. In verses 26 and 27, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace... I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So we have peace in Jesus Christ, if we're his child tonight. And we also have the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. Something else with trials is they make us humble. I'm going to tell you right now, it's hard to be prideful when you're going through a trial. It's a very humbling experience, and it'll bring you to your knees. And I'm going to turn to Job 22 and verse 29. It says, When men are cast down, then thou shalt say there is a lifting up. And he shall save the humble person. So when we humble ourselves, the Lord will take care of us. And again, it's hard to be prideful when you're in a valley. Trials will also draw us closer to Christ. And I'll turn to James back in ver chapter 1 and verses 5 and 6. It says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, it upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. You know, even Job, when he was going through a trial, he questioned God. Now, the only difference between Job and us is we have God's word. Job didn't have that. So when we're going through trials, we can find comfort in God's word. The easiest way through a trial is prayer and God's word. And what does God's word say? Well, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, 
but was in all points tempted likewise as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus is able to comfort us because he's been there. Well, he walked this earth. The only difference is he did it without sin. In Romans 8 and verse 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So if we keep serving God, he's going to draw us through these. And lastly, in James chapter 5 and verse 16, it says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So we need to pray for each other in times of trial. We've got our brothers and our sisters to fall on. You know, people always ask, well, what do you go to church for? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. The fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ, that lifts me up. You know, y'all may not realize it, but just, you know, when you, Brother Tom calls me every once in a while and checks on me, and that means so much to me. I believe it was a week or two he called me and just said, I want you to know, and I was the sheep of the week that week, but he told me, he said, we're praying for you. I just want you to know, and God's going to do something good for you. And I haven't seen it yet, but I know he is because I've got that faith. But that's all I've got for tonight. I've never been accused of being long-winded. One time I think I was, and it, the man was laughing when he said it. So this time I'm going to turn the service back over to Brother Tom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian. Both messages spoke to my heart. First of all, uh, Brother Matthew, predestination is a Bible. I've also had to wrestle this, and, you know, it gets into these complications of theology where people argue one point or another point. But Calvin, uh, predestination is a Bible doctrine. To me, it just means that God knows everything. It never means that he chooses what the end will be. The choice is still free will. I believe that one of the greatest tragedies of Calvinism is individuals and churches who embrace Calvinism stop witnessing it. I know that's not from God. That's not the God I know in this Bible. The God of this Bible tells us to be active and to uh, do all we can. The great purpose of our life is to share our faith, not to sit back as a church. And uh, I knew a Calvinistic pastor. They never had visitation in their church. They didn't visit or, or share their faith. I don't. I think they had tracts, but it was not a big deal. Anyway, it was a blessing to me. And uh, Adrian was talking about how in in tri tribulations we humble ourselves. And I was thinking, now wait a minute, who humbles themselves? The key was in verse two. It starts off and he says, "My brethren." It's talking to believers. Believers in trials, because what happens in trials? A lot of people become bitter in the world when we don't have the Lord. But when, when it says, my brethren, when we know the Lord is our Savior and we're in a trial, we can always find um, God uses those times to give us peace and blessing. Um, we hadn't prayed in a while. Brother Tommy, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Thank you for listening to this message today. It is our prayer that this sermon fed your soul, lifted your spirit, and encouraged you in your walk with God. And as we conclude, please remember, there's always a place for you at Bible Baptist Church.